Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and we're working on a series titled 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Now, out of 101 verses, uh, we worked our way up to, I think, number 82 on the list. To, uh, we'll begin with that today. Uh, if you have not seen the previous videos covering all these other verses, uh, I hope you go back and watch this series from the beginning. Um, so let's get started, brother. Uh, uh, the first verse uh, today is Romans 5, uh, 8 and 9. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Well, we talked about this verse in context with Romans 5.10 a few videos ago, uh, talking about being reconciled to God and how he reconciled us to himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is uh, obviously what, uh, Paul is um, teaching the, the Romans and, and telling the Romans here, um, you know, what stands out for me, again, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, we're condemned in our sins, but Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but to save us. And uh, he did so uh, through the cross, and we receive his payment for our sins by faith in him and and we become justified and we become righteous by receiving his right righteousness um it's it's his justifying us um through what he did for us um you know in verse 9 it says uh, much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him and you know the word wrath reminds us of John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And Paul makes this point about wrath just before Romans 5. In Romans 4, he talks about wrath in relationship with the law. And in Romans 4, 15, it says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So the law is what works wrath. Uh, <laughs> wrath is the works of the law. And if we stay under the works of the law, then we will receive the wrath of God uh, because we haven't used the law properly and allowed it to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. Um, so that we may accept his righteousness and not try to establish our righteousness. Uh, so that's, you know, trying to look at this verse a little bit different angle than we did a couple of videos ago. That's sort of what I uh, see here today. Mm -hmm. uh, often I've said this in this uh, series, we come to a verse and I say, this is one of my favorite verses for, um, evangelism. Um, I have a, <laughs> if you go watch any of my street preaching videos, you, you'll see I'm sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, it's because I had a, a bad health condition with my back and I couldn't stand for more than 30 seconds and my legs would go numb. So I had to preach uh, sitting. Uh, but so you, you'll see me in a wheelchair. That's the, that's the reason I was in the wheelchair. Uh, and since then, of course, thanks to surgeons like you, brother, I have a back surgeon that fixed me, so I'm quite physically fit now. <laughs> but if you watch those videos, you'll see a lot of, uh, I'll be preaching and I'll have a piece of paper uh, with, uh, that I keep on reading from. And it's a list of verses that I want to cover. They're selected verses that I believe these are the go-to verses for me to present the gospel. And... Uh, this is on the list. Now, I had all those verses memorized. I didn't have to look at it and read them. 
but you'll see me reading the verse, and it's because I didn't want people to think I'm just I'm just making up this as I go. You know, I wanted to give them the impression. In fact, I was reading the verses, so they know this is this is what is written. Um, but this verse, uh, all that to just make the point that this is one of those go-to verses for evangelism, and I'm going to tell you why I love it so much. Uh, but God commendeth his love toward us. Um, I think one of the modern translations says God demonstrated his love toward us. He showed us how much he loved us. That's my translation or my uh, uh, <laughs> my paraphrase of the he showed us how much he loved us. Uh, and it's it's kind of like John three sixteen. God for God so loved the world. I mean, let's have put a lot of O's on that. He so loved the world. This, God wants us to know that He loves us so much that He wants to show us how much He loved us. And Jesus said, uh, "There is no greater love than than giving your life for a friend." And so Jesus was willing to give his life for you and me. He, we, we believe that he would have given his life if there's just one of us. That's how much he values every individual. He was willing to die for you and me. So that's a demonstration of love. And I've always felt, and this, is, this was my, my salvation conversion experience was based upon understanding this love. There's a, there's a verse that says, um, we love him because he first loved us. And when I finally understood how much Jesus loved me, I couldn't help but love him in return. And uh, that uh, led to me, you know, uh, uh, trusting him, relying on him for my salvation, understanding all of that and getting, getting saved. Uh, so God committed his love toward us. Now, here is a very important point so to refute the people that are telling us you've got to get sin out of your life as a prerequisite you've got to stop sinning repent of your sins change your life make yourself acceptable to god or you, you won't get saved but this says in that while we were yet sinners christ died for us and my paraphrase of that is that in spite of the fact that we were just all a bunch of sinners, without exception. Every person falls short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, not even one. The best righteousness of uh, the best man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. In spite of all that, even while we were such sinful creatures, he was willing to die for us, not expecting us to change our lives, clean up our lives, and make ourselves you know, uh, acceptable to him first. There's, that would be impossible. Uh, so that's why I think this is so important that uh, it tells us that, look, there's an old gospel song, uh, Just As I Am. And the ironic thing is, you'll have a choir singing the song, Come Just As I Am, and, and, and telling basically the message of the song. By the way, I have a, I have a video. Uh, where I did with Jack Smack recently, where we went through about five or six popular old hymns. And the, the greatest clear gospel messages we find in these old hymns, but this, the hymn, Just As I Am, has a great gospel message in it saying this very thing here. Just as you are, don't, don't wait to try to clean up your life. Come just as you are right now. Even though you're just a, a sinner, a drunk, a, 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 a drug addict, an adulterer, a thief, a, a covetous, all these things that we all are uh, come as we are because he'll, he accepts us in that sinful state. He was willing to die for us even while we were sinners. Um, now, uh, I'll, I'll get back to verse 9. Uh, I want to talk about that, but before I go on any further, let me get your feedback on that. Yeah, we're in perfect agreement there. This is a great verse, one of my favorite verses, showing the love of God toward us. Uh, 
And this clearly shows that God doesn't expect us to clean up our lives in order to come to him for salvation. We come to him just as we are and then allow his grace and his love to clean us up after we receive his love, his grace through faith in him. Um, if we try to do it the other way around, it's not going to work out um, because it's going to be by the will of man. And it's not of the will of man, not of the will of the flesh, but of God uh, that we are saved. Yeah. I heard you say recently, maybe it was in our video yesterday, or maybe it was in one of the recent videos you just put up. Uh, you're talking about if a person's sick, they don't try to heal themselves and then they go to the doctor. They go in their sick sick state to the doctor. No real not trying to get healthy first, you know, knowing that they need the doctor to, to heal them. And uh, that's a really good illustration, I think. Uh, okay, verse 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Uh, saved from wrath through him. Uh, um, I, uh, I realize that some people get saved because of their fear of God's wrath. They want to be spared that wrath. They want to be saved from that wrath. To me, I see I see the, the wrath now as, oh, and since he's already paid for all of our sins, I see the wrath as just, okay, you're not going to have eternal life. You're going to be extinguished. You're going to perish the second death in the lake of fire. Um, so I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, you know, trying to scare people into salvation. Now, some people, that's a big part of their their um, evangelism. And uh, maybe some people, that's necessary. Uh, but as I said, my experience was I didn't come to Jesus for salvation because I was afraid of the consequences. I came to him because I understood he loved me so much. I wanted that relationship with him. So there's various ways that, you know, various kind of motivations, I guess, that we have to that come to Jesus moment. Uh, but I don't really personally talk a lot about that, that aspect of it, uh, except to say that, look, there's, um, you, you need to be saved. And what are you saved from? You're saved from being condemned. That you're saved from the second death in the lake of fire. And that's enough said on it, I think. Uh, but I want to talk about the blood again. We might have talked about this on the last uh, uh, last verse when we were talking about blood, but I, there's there's another hymn. I'll, I'll give another plug to my video on all the hymns, but uh, it's nothing but the blood. And um, I've always said that I use the the uh, kind of the illustration that if you died today and you were in front of God, and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? Plead your case. What would you plead? What would you say? And, and this is a good way to diagnose a person's faith, diagnose their condition. And almost every person will say, well, I would tell God that, you know, I've tried to be a good person. I've, uh, I even tried to follow the golden rule, even the Ten Commandments. And uh, I even join the church, and I go to church all the time. I give money to charity. I, 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 I. Their plea is based upon themselves, what they have done to be justified, justifying themselves before God through their own merit. And that's, uh, that's going to fall on deaf ears. Jesus is say, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity, because all of the works of man, without the salvation that we have, all of those works are just uh, work, works of iniquity. They, they have no value at all. They're like filthy rags, as we said earlier. The, but the, uh, you and I, if we were presented with that scenario, uh, 
we wouldn't say, and Jesus gives us the same kind of illustration in his in the scriptures, when he says, on, on that day, some will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these wonderful works in your name? So he, he does paint the same picture that there will be a time someday where people go before him and plead their case. Um, but uh, in, our, in our case, um, when he sees us, he just embraces us and say, says, well done, good and faithful servant. You're acceptable to, to me. You're mine. Uh, and uh, because our plea would be nothing but the blood. Just at the point I'm getting at is that him, nothing but the blood. That's the plea. That's what we're, our, our, we're pleading our case upon. Jesus' blood was shed and paid. In, in that way, my sins were paid for. Because, because of that, the um, Bible says that I'm righteous uh, because of what Jesus did for me. And the Bible says that I get to go to heaven because Jesus promised it to me if I would trust him. That would be my plea before God, you know. But I plead the blood. All right. Uh, any more on this verse, brother? No, I agree. Amen. Um, it's all about the blood in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, then I'll, uh, I'll go to the next verse. Let me see what it is. Uh, it's uh, Matthew 18, 11. Okay, it says, uh, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. That's short and sweet, brother. That is. Um, and, you know, this reminds us of, um, again, just to quote John 3.16 once again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then goes on for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he's, he's not, con again, not coming to condemn us. He's coming to save us, to save that which is lost. And, you know, this goes hand in hand with, um, you know, I think Luke 15 where um, Jesus is relating um, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, this talking about um, right after this, for the son of man is come to save that which was lost. Um, in Matthew 18, 12, the next verse, he talks about the hundred sheep and wanting to be gone astray, doth he not leave the 99 and goeth for the, for the one. Uh, he relates that same parable or, or Luke relates that same parable in Luke 15 um, just before the prodigal son uh, parable. Um, so, and we talked about this the other day, um, you know, just before this, you know, he's, he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees here um, who are prideful and who are non-believers they're workers of iniqu iniquity. They have the leaven of hypocrisy, of unbelief, um, and they're trusting in themselves. And he tells them in Matthew 18, 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Um, but then he goes on and talks about um, the offenses and um, you know, to offend is, is to transgress, to um, basically commit sin, a worker of iniquity. And that's who he was talking to. He was talking to the scribes and Pharisees who were self-righteous and looking at themselves, but really they were full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And he starts telling them, you know, if your hand or foot offend thee, cut it off. You know, it's better to enter life halt or maimed than have two feet or two hands 
uh, and be cast in everlasting fire. And if you're off in a fan, pluck it out, you know, and the Pharisees didn't get it. You know, they were saying, well, maybe um, we aren't following the law well enough and we need to work a little harder um, and, and make sure we're doing all these things, you know, following the law to a T. Um, but like we talked about the other day, Jesus is, again, talking in impossibilities. Really, he's saying, you know, if you try to establish your own righteousness and follow the law perfectly, you're not going to make it whole. You're going to fall apart. <laughs> you know, you're going to you're going to enter short of the glory of God without extremities and without eyes and whatever else you have to do. Uh, if you're going to trust in your own righteousness. Uh, but what did he say to, um, you know, the blind man and, and the, uh, the woman, you know, he says, thy faith made thee whole, you know, working, trying to work our way to heaven makes us fall apart. Just like here in Matthew 18, six, but our faith in him makes us whole. So that is sort of, um, I think, what he is trying to uh, relate to the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 18 here. Hmm. Okay. The, to me, the word lost, um, it's when people, if we weren't talking about theology, and you ask someone, what does the word lost mean? Uh, they don't think of it in terms of uh, going to hell or hell. They, they, they think of it as, uh, well, I've misplaced something, it's lost, or I'm lost in the forest and I can't find my way out, you know. Um, but uh, this, the, the use of the word lost in this case uh, is the same thing as condemned. Um, and Jesus said, I think you might have mentioned this other verse already, that uh, he said uh, that uh, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Uh, but it also says that uh, if you believe on the Son, you're not condemned. But if you do not believe on the Son, you are condemned already. You are lost already. You are destined for the second death and the lake of fire. That's what it's really telling us. So he, Jesus is telling us that uh, the, the natural state of all men uh, is that we are lost and need to be changed. And that status has to be changed. We need to be go from lost and condemned to saved and reborn. Uh, so, uh, you know, I didn't really think that much about uh, this word uh, until the computers got popular. You know, we have a thing called default settings, you know, and I, I, I just said that the, the default fate of man is, is uh, hell. Uh, that, that second death in the lake of fire that's the default that's that's where everybody's going unless they get saved from it so uh, it's not like uh, some people really work really hard at going to hell everybody starts off in a neutral position and some do better and some do worse and stuff and and then you get judged and everything's put on a scale and balanced and uh, no and everybody starts off as absolutely lost and condemned. And that's the default for everybody. Uh, anybody who's watching this, if you never got saved, then you're condemned. You're lost. You're you're going to go to, to hell. Or I was the hell is a popular way of expressing it. But uh, you're going to suffer the second death in the lake of fire. That's the fate of every man unless you change that. And that's the only one way of changing it. And that's by trusting Jesus to do it for you, uh, relying on him. All right. Um, anything, anything more about that? There's not much to this verse, but I, I, I just think that understanding, most people understand what the word lost is to a certain extent anyway, since we're talking about 
you know, theology here. Right. That was short and sweet. I think we can move on. Okay. Let me put in the next one. Into the, this one is uh, Acts 15, uh, verses 10 and 11. Uh, now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. This is Peter speaking um, in the book of Acts in Acts 15. And this is in response to uh, certain men which came down from Judea, as it says in verse 1, and taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Uh, so there was this dispute, and after much disputing, Peter rose up, as it says in verse 7, and says, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Uh, then, and that's going through verse 10. So now we get to, um, you know, verse 10 and 11. And so he tells them, why are you trying to put the yoke of the law, the yoke of bondage, on the neck of these believers, these new babes in Christ, these followers of Christ who have acknowledged their sins and turned to Jesus Christ, turned from dead works to faith unto God through Jesus Christ. Why are now, after they've turned from those dead works, why are you trying to get them right back under the law? and looking at those dead works and trying to establish, um, trying to get them to establish their own righteousness again. They've already turned from that to Jesus Christ and rested in his finished work. And so it tells you after that, you know, basically making that distinction about the law and don't do that, you know, don't tell them they have to be circumcised in the same, um, you know, man or today, the teachers that teach baptismal regeneration that you have to be water baptized, you know, that's the same exact thing as Peter is rebuking here. Um, don't look back at the commandments that you think that that can save you. It can't, you know, um, the law just is, is wrath as, as we just talked about. Um, if it doesn't lead you to Christ, but by allowing the law to lead you to Christ, then what was, what must we do to be saved? As it says in, um, you know, as the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Barnabas in at 1630, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Peter in the same fashion tells them but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So he's pointing back to their fathers, you know, and this is before Jesus' ministry um, and their father's fathers, which, you know, you could trace back to, um, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years to the, to, um, you know, through Moses and, and even further back um, through Jacob or Israel and Isaac and Abraham. And Peter's making the point that they weren't saved by the works of the law. Why are you getting these guys under the works of the law, which are a yoke upon their neck? But just like Abraham was saved by faith, by God's grace through faith, believing in him and his promises, they are, they are saved the same way. So that's what he's saying. 
Well, to me, uh, Acts 15 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Uh, and sadly, um, I think what we can learn from Acts 15 is kind of like just kind of like uh, what is it you know, where you just superficially read over something without really trying to analyze it and break it down. It's just kind of just uh, people only have a very superficial understanding of it. So uh, at this point, I would um, urge everybody, as I've done many times before, I have a playlist titled uh, The Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Now, I'm not looking at someone else's commentary on the book. I'm making my own commentary on Acts, one, one verse at a time. And in Acts chapter 15, in that study, I had something amazing happen. I had two brothers that worked with me quite a bit. And uh, we came to a point in there where I had to part company with them because they didn't understand this. And it, it is, it's that essential and critical to get. Acts 15.1, you have men from uh, Judea, from the, like the Jerusalem church area, who they're approaching Paul's uh, disciples and telling them they got to get circumcised or they can't be saved. Now, why would they, why would they do that? Well, when you really understand Acts and Galatians and Romans and Hebrews and put it all together, um, you can watch my playlist, Paul only isn't debunked. That, that's, that also addresses all these problems. But you'll understand that the book of Acts is really a, a historical account of the first 30 years of church history. And we didn't have a perfect church from day one as far as the way you and I believe and teach right now. That wasn't established from day one universally. Uh, what we have to realize is that all the believers for the first 10 years were Jews. No Gentile believers until Cornelius, 10 years after Pentecost. So for 10 years, this religion of Jewish believers in Christ was growing, but they didn't, there are two things they didn't understand in the beginning. They didn't know that Jesus came for the whole world, not just Israel and the Jews. They, they never dreamed that Gentiles would be included in this. When God sent Peter to the Gentiles, long before Paul, and, and, and that's when this can of worms was opened up and debated. Now they got Gentiles coming into the church and uh, becoming believers. What's expected of them? The other problem was all the Jewish believers were still practicing Judaism, circumcision, dietary laws, the Sabbath, uh, temple worship, animal sacrifice, all that stuff was still going on. And they believed that was an integral part. It's kind of like the Lordship salvation is today. They're saying it's faith and works. You know, that you need faith, but you got to have your works too. And, and so, that's the way it was in the beginning of the church. They thought, basically, they thought you had to convert to Judaism. You had to get circumcised and then practice Judaism. Then you would be able to believe in Jesus. And that's what this here, this argument here in this verse is, is all about, is that they, they, were, they thought that all the laws of Judaism still applied to them, and now they are trying to impose the same things on these Gentile believers, and Paul stood up for it and took a stand and went to Jerusalem to argue this out. That's what this verse is really point making the point of it. And getting back to the way you, you explained it, that's exactly right. We, we need to understand that, uh, as Peter says here, why are you trying to impose all these rules and regulations on them? We have never been able to follow it throughout all of our history. We, we fail. You're trying to impose something on them that we can't even do. Now, that's not ridiculous. <clears throat> Peter understood it right. But, of course, later on, even though Peter ate with Cornelius, ate Gentile food, he's up in Antioch eating with the Gentiles. But when the men from James come, he leaves the Gentiles and go eats with the Jews, Jewish at table. 
eating kosher food, and that caused the argument with him and Paul. And uh, was it, I don't remember if it was Barnabas or Silas, but I think it was Barnabas that, was, that joined Peter in that. So Paul gave them a tongue lashing publicly over that because they were hypocrites. So Peter was kind of stuck in the middle. He was trying to please everybody. He wanted to please James and, and the Jerusalem church. <clears throat> Yeah, and but he, he he knew the right thing was God told him nothing's unclean in his vision, nothing's unclean. So he started eating regular instead of Jewish dietary laws. He knew that didn't apply anymore. But he was kind of playing both sides, trying to be friends with both sides instead of instead of taking a stand for the truth that that, that Paul stood up for. That uh, wait a second, you got to get your this your this right in your mind. Judaism has no place here anymore. Get that out of your head. Don't try to impose circumcision or dietary laws or animal sacrifices or any of these things on these believers. Otherwise, you've ruined it. It's no longer grace if you're imposing that. You can't mix them or it's ruined. So that's the argument. And that's what Paul, Paul's primary mission was to clarify that problem. Okay, brother. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to... Uh, continue that thought process. The verses right after um, Acts 15, 10, and 11, which you know we just went over, um, don't um, we shouldn't neglect the the words of James beginning in verse 13, um, and kind of explains, you know, about what you're talking about with the, the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and uh, it says in verse 13, James answers saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon had declared, so he's, he's talking about Peter, how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and to this agree the words of the prophet as written, after this I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So, you know, initially since the creation of the world, the gospel has gone out to all of mankind, all nations, the Gentiles over time after the flood and, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the law of Moses is established and you have a, um, a remnant of people that God chose for them to present the oracles of God to the nations. Um, and so that's what this is talking about. Then Jesus Christ comes and it's almost like, you know, two ships passing in the night. Now the Jewish nations have puffed themselves up and have established their own righteousness. They're using the law um, and using all these religious works improperly, um, they're not worshiping uh, the Messiah to come, even though they think they are, but their heart is full of iniquity and pride. Um, so the gospel goes out to the nations. And, um, you know, and this is the, the beginning of that, as you said, um, but they're... I just want to make sure that before the cross, there's always been a remnant of Gentiles who have believed that there was a Messiah to come and were saved by faith, by grace through faith in the Messiah to come and were part of the crucifixion and were dead with Christ. They didn't know the complete story of Christ, um, you know, that that he that his name was Jesus, he was to come, and that he was going to be born of a virgin. They knew some of those prophecies, but didn't know quite how that would work out. But they believed in God's promise and the Messiah to come, and that they were sinners, and that they were going to be saved from their sins, from, um, you know, from the wrath of God by the Redeemer, by the Deliverer. And and so, you know, just like in Matthew 15, the Canaanite woman, um, you know, she wasn't Jewish and Jesus came to her and said, you know, 
I'm not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Um, you know, and so in the one in the one sense, we just talked about, you know, that the Son of Man came to save what is lost, you know, and Jesus in Matthew 15, 24, tells the Canaanite woman that he's not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But I just want to make the point clear that she is part of the remnant of believers of the Gentile nations outside the house of Israel physically, but she's in the house of Israel spiritually. Um, so she is one of those lost sheep of the house of Israel, this Canaanite woman that Jesus is speaking to because of her faith. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we know that there's always a remnant of believers, um, whether during the time where the house of Israel is prominent, there are always people within every tribe, language, and nation who believed on God and the, the true God, the Messiah to come. Um, and as there is today, there is still a remnant within the Jewish nation who believe on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, you know, there's always going to be 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And that works both ways, um, no matter which side of the cross we're on. So I just want to make that point clear. Yeah, that's a good point. And I will take it a step further. You, uh, you said that, oh, I'm getting an echo. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, you said that there's a remnant today among the Jewish people. Some of the Jewish people are saved today, but believing correctly. But the way I see it, Everybody who's saved today is just a remnant because we're such a tiny part of the world. I mean, how you, we couldn't, uh, they say Christianity is about a third of the world's, world's population. <clears throat> um, but that's what I would call Christendom. Christendom, uh, to me, it means uh, anybody who identifies themselves as some kind of a Christian. Uh, put a check mark next to your religion on this form and they say, oh, Christian, okay? But what do they believe? We don't know, they just say that they're a Christian. But if we talk to them, we'll find out that even out of the one third of the population that say they're Christians, I don't think there's more than 10% of those that are Christians as we understand Christianity, a biblical, Christian, someone who believes that our own works and our own effort doesn't factor into our salvation at all. It's entirely, our salvation is determined entirely by what Jesus did for us and our reliance on that. How many of all of Christendom believe that? A very tiny fraction. And to me, Christianity as a whole is a remnant. Uh, anything before I go to the next verse? No, that was a great discussion. Okay. Um, okay, this one is 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Another great verse. Um, this goes hand in hand with Romans 5, 8. I'm sure this is, why this is on the list so close to Romans 5 8 because it's the same premise uh, for God came in his love for us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us here in 2nd Corinthians 5 21 for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him uh, obviously this is speaking of Jesus Christ and if we go back to verse 18 it says, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, and then 
the next verse to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And we talked about reconciliation, um, you know, basically being a restoration of um, our, for a, a relationship to be restored. And that is how um, God commends his love toward us. Um, even though we are sinners and ungodly, um, through Jesus Christ, we can receive um, his love, his mercy, his reconciliation, his restoration. Um, and Jesus Christ is the minister of reconciliation. He is the word of reconciliation in verses 18 and 19. Um, and so, again, that leads us back to verse 21. Um, Christ led us, Jesus Christ led a sinless life and paid for our transgressions um, and nailed it to the cross. Uh, he allowing God not to impute our trespasses to us, but rather he imputes Jesus' sinless record and perfect righteousness on our account. Um, and that's how we are made the righteousness of God. It's in him. It's in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, when it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Uh, the picture that, that I have in my mind as Jesus is on the cross, as he's suffering and dying on the cross, this verse and um, many verses in the Bible, we, we, I conclude that all these sins were like put on to Jesus. Uh, I've given an analogy I learned from a, a street preacher, I guess, you know, he, he said, and imagine that every time that you sinned, you, your body got a wart. And the wart symbolized, it showed that was, that, that was caused because of your sin. And as we go through our lives, pretty much, it doesn't take long before we're just completely covered with warts. And uh, uh, some people have a lot more warts than others, probably. But if we go up to, to heaven and there's a sign above the gate that says, no warts allowed. <laughs> you can't get in. And, and I say to you, brother, you've got thousands of warts. You can't get in there. And you look at me and you laugh and say, but look, it says no warts allowed. That means zero. I know you have less warts than me, <laughs> but if you have one wart, you're not allowed in there. No warts allowed. It's a wart free zone, you know? Um, and I've often thought, wouldn't it be nice if that's really the way it worked? If, if we, every time we sinned, we got a wart, it's like the scarlet letter, you know? that we actually got something on us so that we couldn't hide our sin from other people. No, nothing secret, you know, that, hey, maybe not necessarily what the sin was, but at least a, a, an acknowledgement that that wart represents you did something and there's thousands of them on you. Well, I'm, all this to illustrate that when Jesus is on the cross, imagine all my sins put on him, like all these warts put on him. Or let's call, let's call them boils, because boils are even more repulsive and, and they're painful. Uh, and then all yours, brother, and you know you've got a lot more than me, right? No, I've got more than you. But all yours are on him too. And all from Adam to every person ever who's ever lived through, until the end of history, all of those, past, present, future, every person, all of them were put on Jesus. And that's what it means to me when it says he became sin for us. Uh, well, let me see. Is that he was made for he hath made him to be sin for us. Is there another what verse or is it just a different translation that says he became sin for us? You can probably find that if it's there. Uh, so that's how I see that. And that's how I that the picture I get in my mind from that verse that that's Jesus on the cross, the sins of the whole world were transferred off of me and put on to him. Uh, 
Now, it also it says, uh, who, who knew no sin. So this is saying Jesus was the one that, who knew no sin. That means that he had never sinned. We all say Jesus never sinned. And how do we know that? Uh, I don't know if there's more verses, but there's at least one verse where Jesus challenges the people. He says, who can convict me of sin? I mean, how arrogant is that? I told you I might have met a couple of people in my life and all my witnessing and evangelism work. Only a couple of people denied. No, I've never sinned. I mean, but that's the height of arrogance and conceit, self-righteousness, spiritual pride. And yet Jesus said it. So he's either this horrible, spiritually proud person, or he's really sin-free. <laughs> what do you say, brother? Yeah, let me get it off mute here. Um, the I, I love the analogies, and you know it reminds us this verse of First Peter two, where it says, and this is speaking of Jesus Christ, verse twenty two, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Uh, and that goes back, Peter quoting uh, Isaiah 53. And so, uh, you know, another image that we get. Um, from this verse is right before the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Um, Jesus says in John 3, 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, so that is speaking of the brass serpent um, that uh, Moses lifted up when the the um, snakes had bitten the the Israelites in the wilderness, and many had died. And by faith, they were healed and spared their life by looking at the serpent of brass. Um, this was obviously um, symbolic for um, our sin on the cross and Jesus sacrificing Himself for our sins. Yeah. Well, you know, they say great minds stink alike. I mean, think alike. And this is this is my note here. I don't know. Can you can you read that where my fingers are? Is that clear? Is that clear what it's saying? Yes, I can read it. Brass serpent. Yeah, it says brass serpent. I wrote that down uh, before I actually talked last time. I in intended to talk about that, but I forgot. But you must have had a Vulcan mind meld with me. And you got that thought out of my head. And uh, yeah, because that to me is another perfect picture. Uh, Jesus, Jesus even, you know, taught that that was a picture of him. And he said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, uh, and, and in that way, I will draw all men to myself. By him being lifted up on that cross, he's saying, everybody, come to me. Come to me for salvation. Uh, but the serpent, why a serpent? If I, I used to think, before I understood things as, as well as I do now, uh, I didn't say I understand them perfectly now, but I understand them better than I used to. I used to wonder, why the serpent? What a horrible thing to compare Jesus to. But the serpent, of course, is symbolic of sin. And I said, why Jesus? Be, like, it's sin. Well, it's verses like this that, hey, he became sin for us. He, he, he hath made him to be sin for us. So the, the, the serpent on the pole is the exact right picture to show us Jesus on the cross being completely covered, immersed in our sins. Oh, that, that means there was another thing I was going to say. Uh, believe it believe in you said oh yeah no here it is one last thought on this verse and wait let me let me stop and do anything else you want to say about this before i continue on i don't want to monopolize this no go ahead 
Okay. Uh, I, when I said uh, immersed, uh, I, I was going to say this. Uh, that's why I have a little notepad here. Sometimes I write it. So, uh, it takes me about 10 seconds to lose my thoughts. Uh, but it says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, in Christ. Now, you talked about being in Christ. Now, there's a lot of ways, I think, that we can look at that. What does it mean, God in him? Um, he is God. Um, and uh, or is it saying that we are in him? It says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I think it's talking about not the righteousness of God in Jesus, but that we are in Jesus. And uh, that to me, uh, we have a lot of times the word baptize is uh, translated. Uh, I think it might be translated wrong. And it, it should be, uh, it, it really means being immersed. Now we think of being immersed as being immersed underwater. Uh, but but let's imagine that I could actually have Jesus here, and I actually come inside, and I'm actually inside. I'm immersed into Jesus. Uh, that's what being baptized uh, is, or immersed, believing in. You could say, I believe in Jesus. You could also say, I believe into Jesus. So that makes me immersed in Jesus all right I think I might even confuse myself on that one <laughs> okay uh, I think we're close to an hour I didn't make a note until about 15 minutes later but I, I, I what do you think did you know what time we started it was a little after 7 30 my time so okay. so shall we uh, sum things up now or try another one let's do one more okay because it'll because we've talked about this next verse before, so I think we can do it quickly. Okay, that's Matthew 19, 25 and 26, right? Correct. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I'm, let me read it. I'm sorry, I forgot. I read it for you first. Uh, it says, uh, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Yeah. So this is the story of the rich young ruler, where, um, which we've talked about before. And so that's why I want to finish up with this, because I think we can do it quickly. But, you know, he comes to Jesus and calls him good master, what things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus says, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. Um, you know, which basically is either Jesus saying he's not good or he's saying that he's God. Uh, and we know the answer to that question. Um, but then he goes on, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And, and he saith unto him, which? You know, which commandments? And so this rich young, young ruler is looking at the law. You know, he's he's automatically got his mind on, okay, what do I have to do? Uh, what works of righteousness, what laws do I have to keep that I may have eternal life? Um, and Jesus starts naming some of the Ten Commandments. And the young man says, I've done all these for my youth up. Um, and, and then Jesus continues to press and press. And finally, he says that if, you're, if thou be perfect, then sell all you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And the young man heard it, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Um, and then this is, the, uh, this is leading into the two verses that... Um, that we're discussing. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. 
And then we enter into this part of the passage when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed saying, who then can be saved? Um, but the point is that our own righteousness, no man can be, it's impossible. It's impossible. So you can be a rich man, a poor man, um, but it, no, matter, no matter who you are, where you live, what gender you are, how old you are, if you're trusting in yourself, and you're trying to do this or this or give up this or this so that you may have eternal life, it's impossible. So that's what Jesus is telling him. You can do whatever you want, but it's impossible. Um, but with God, all things are possible. Um, and, you know, what Jesus was doing was trying, was pointing the rich young ruler to him. Um, and, the rich young ruler was spiritually blind and didn't see the spiritual truths that Jesus was, was relating to him. Um, he didn't have faith. Um, you know, he had a heart of unbelief. Um, therefore, when Jesus spoke the words to him, he couldn't acknowledge the truth of those words, receive the good news that Jesus was there for him, that he was God, and the possibilities of having eternal life was through him. Um, and so people still have that problem today, um, you know, looking at themselves and what they're doing. And um, instead of looking at what God has done for us, we're looking at trying to appease God by what we do for him. But what we need to be doing to receive eternal life is to recognize what he did for us and receive his sacrifice for us that he reconciled us to himself by Jesus and the cross and to receive his free gift of eternal life by placing our trust in him. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, in December of uh, 04, um, I was able to retire from work and go into ministry works, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, I saw this show on TV that just just came out. It was brand new. It's called The Way of the Master. Uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron doing street preaching and evangelism in the streets, and it was called The Way of the Master because they believe that this is the way that Jesus would do it. And uh, this portion of verses here is, is what they are basing it on, that Jesus would go through the commandments with someone first. And, uh, and so that was, that was the heart of that method that they used. Um, when I first saw them, I, didn't, uh, I ordered Ray Comfort's book. He had a real big, thick book. Uh, I read that. Uh, I ordered all of his uh, DVDs or CDs, whatever they were at that time, like 20 of them. Uh, I mean, I really studied his system. And, and as I realized that, wait a second, this is not uh, free gift salvation. This is uh, God does this, but you must do this. And, and, and your, your part is repent of your sins, change your life, get sin completely out of your life. And then you can put your faith in Jesus. So it's the way Ray Comfort explains it he says it's uh, salvation is like a coin with two sides faith in jesus on one side repenting of your sins and to, th to him that means completely stopping your sin uh, is on the other side of the coin both are needed uh, so when i understood that of course i basically burned all of his materials and stuff and but it was interesting learning that system but that watching them do what they did in the streets was they gave me the impetus to to go out into the streets and start doing something. So in, in, in that way, it inspired me. But uh, also, I've, I've made videos and I've talked a lot of uh, teaching against it because what they're, see, he's, Ray Comfort is a damnable heretic and he's spiritually blind because when we talk about these verses or when we talk about Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful works I did in your name, uh, or we talk about, uh, uh, fruit, uh, you know, I will know them by their fruit. Uh, 
Uh, we all, all these things that we, we understand correctly, the Lordship heretics take the same verses that we use to prove that works are not part of it, and they flip it around somehow, they don't get it, and they flip it around and use it for their purposes. So that's what Ray comforts them with this. He says, he believes that the way of the master is what Jesus did. You tell them about the commandments, convict them of, of their sin, and then tell them, not just believe on Jesus, but first you got to stop all those sins. <laughs> you know, so that's that's the fatal error of it, telling people they've got to heal themselves before they go to the doctor, as we said earlier. Uh, but what I find also interesting about this is I looked at the location of this verse, Matthew 19, 25, and 26. So we're 19 chapters into Matthew. Now, I, I'm, I'm speaking off the top of my head. I haven't analyzed this to, say, to know that this is a fact. But I believe in the previous chapters, um, we have, uh, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Go and be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. We have all these things that Jesus is telling them, and then this is the climax of all these things that the apostles are hearing from Jesus. And, and they're finally reached the point where they, I give up. You're telling me i got to cut off my hand, gouge up my eyes, be perfect, and now even a, a rich man can't even get into heaven. Is he for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? Then that causes them to finally say, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? They thought, nobody can do all the things you're telling us that, that are required. That's why I always call these sayings the impossible sayings of Jesus. Jesus is not telling us about all these things, but expecting us to do it to earn salvation. He's telling us all these things so we can come to the conclusion that these apostles did here. Who can be saved if this is the case? And then he tells them, the truth is, you can't do it. With man, it is impossible. Now you get it. You finally get it. I've been telling you to do things you can't do. Now you get it. That, do you understand now? That's why you need me. I'm your savior. <laughs> All right, brother. Hey, man, you, you've summarized that perfectly. I, I don't need to add to that. Um, that was great. But it, it's amazing how just like you went through, you know, looking at the chapter before and then this um, – this account in Matthew 19 and Jesus is saying, you know, you have to do this and this and keep the commandments. And then it, once you do that, then do this and this. And once you do that, then go and that will be perfect. And finally, you know, again, the disciples threw their hands up and he says, it's impossible for you. You know, that's what he's saying. All these things I'm telling you, it's impossible to do. Um, but yet, you have the spiritually blind that will look at this and think that it, it is it is possible to do for man um, and and don't rest in what is only possible through Jesus Christ. Um, so, again, you know, just just like we talked about um, spiritually blind people use uh, these works based heretics will use verses that clearly are pointing to one thing and will completely twist them to teach their false doctrines. Um, and uh, I've spoke about Ray Comfort. I, I was like you a few years ago, you know, just sort of um, reading the Bible and I had a zeal for, for God, you know, and I was, all right, I've, I've got the gospel. I'm going to, and I saw, I was exactly like you, you know, I saw a couple of Ray Comfort's videos real quick and saw that he was out witnessing, really not listening to him close. And said, I want to do that. And I looked up and he had a new King James Bible that he was selling uh, <laughs> with commentary. And, you know, I, I read through the, you know, what it was all about. And it's like, you know, you can witness to uh, Muslims and Catholics and Jehovah's Witness, you know, and Ray Comfort tells you how to do this throughout his commentaries. I'm like, this is great. You know, if I go out and 
go soul winning and knocking doors and I run across a Muslim, I don't, I don't know exactly what to say to him. And if I run across a Catholic, I don't know exactly what to say to him because I've read Ray Comfort's commentary out of his new King James Bible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after reading the new King James Bible and comparing it to the KJV and say, wait, there's there's some things that aren't, you know, this isn't just an updated version of the King James. You know, I was still new to that, too, uh, with modern Bible translations. And then seeing that Ray Comfort was actually pointing people to the law, but never getting off the law and telling them to uphold the law and keep people in the bondage of the law and never using that as a schoolmaster to Christ. Um, you know, needless to say, long story short, that New King James commentary from Ray Comfort is collecting dust on my shelf as we speak. I, I had that little, little Bible of his, a New Testament Bible with all those stories. Uh, he had some really good illustrations too that were actually very good until he, it was ruined with repent of your sins as part of a a part of the solution so uh um yeah and i i i threw that away if i didn't burn it or something i, I got rid of all that stuff i didn't want anybody else to get it so i didn't give it away to something i didn't want them to be ruined from it uh okay brother i guess uh it's time for a, a, a summary can you sum up the study yeah this was fun tonight um as usual it's always fun but uh, i really enjoyed this evening and we started with romans uh, five, eight, and nine, and and we had previously talked about um, you know Romans five and and that passage, um, and so it, we go on from there into Matthew eighteen. We ended up with Matthew nineteen and talked about that, talking about the impossibilities that Jesus Christ is showing that we can't keep the law; that is impossible for man to do. Um, but with God, all things are possible, and that. Um, you know, points us to Acts 15, the gospel that Peter was relating um, in Acts 15, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. And it's through faith in him, what he did, not what we do. Amen. Okay. Uh, thanks again. And uh, just let me know next time you're available. We'll do another one. We're getting uh, pretty near the end here. Let me see. We're on... Uh, let me see what number we're on now. That was number 86. So we have 15 uh, left. At this rate, probably another maybe five, uh, four or five uh, videos, four or five more hours of this. And then I will reveal to you my new plan for you. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Can't wait. Okay. All right. Thank you. And to the viewers, uh, thank you for watching. And uh, as I said before, I, I hope you'll go back and watch all these videos in the series. And I certainly hope you'll share this series with others, who those who especially need this, who don't understand that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ. No religious works are required by us. And if you believe that something else is required, then you're not even saved because you've ruined the pure gospel. So thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.